Well, good evening, everyone. Well, I've been spending a lot of time working on the website lately, and it's, it's, been, it's been great. I appreciate your prayers. It's very, sometimes very difficult, so I appreciate your prayers in this regard. It's not straightforward because you're trying to hear the Lord. You're trying to make it simple, but you don't want to make it so simple that you're not really getting across a point that you need to get across. And so in the process, actually, I've been naturally meditating on the nature of what is the church? And uh, I've, I found that uh, very edifying, challenging, and um, enlightening. One of the things that comes out clear is when Jesus says, in another place in John, that he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, that you love one another, and so prove that you are my disciples. Where he says, by this, people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So really, when you ask what it means to be church, most people would not answer with it with this passage. But it's absolutely essential. Jesus said that you can know a disciple of his, and if a church isn't made of disciples, it's not a church, right? right. Disciples are those who, listen, those who listen to the master, Jesus in this case, to want to be like him, and they're called to imitate him. One of the simple definitions of church is disciples who are making disciples. Of course, you have to fill out what the word disciple means, and here Jesus does. It's those who love the Lord, of course, but those who love one another in the manner that reminds you, that brings to the forefront of your heart and mind that that's how Jesus loves. Jesus loves just like that. He says it's a new commandment that he gives. And it's not, maybe it doesn't sound new, but it's new in this regard. There's never been a time that God has come in the flesh in the person of Jesus of Nazareth and loved someone to the death. Never happened before. Never happened that those who believe in him have a transformed heart and mind, like it says in Ezekiel Ezekiel and Jeremiah. So that once was a heart of stone and now is a heart of flesh, like Jesus. Never happened before. That love has actually changed our hearts. That's a new commandment. It's a new commandment because it's something that calls us to be new the way he is new. And it's an identifier. So in other words, this actually is a passage that's very evangelistic. It says, all men will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another. It doesn't say in that case, because of the gospel that you preach, though clearly you cannot love someone else to the death and the power of the gospel and the love of God not be in his heart. But the testimony of the church always is an embodiment of the gospel more than it is just the recitation of the gospel. The church is being called by the Holy Spirit to be embodying the word of the Lord, not just have words of the Lord. And typically in the Western world, the church is word heavy and body light. But we're called to testify to the word that the Lord has given to us and make it really clear and that we are ready in our heart of hearts, to give up our life for Amanda, for Cole, for you, for me. We're readied for that. How are we readied for that? Our communion with God prepares us for that. But there's no question. There is something appropriate and fitting to see yourself 
ready, able, taking the final steps on behalf of someone else and giving up your life in their behalf because you love them, because you care for them, because you've allowed the Spirit of God to work in your heart of hearts that you are now imitating the Lord. You don't think, I can't do that because I have children. I can't do that because well, I have to take care of some older people in my life. You don't think of that. You think, what, how does Jesus love? And that's the call of the church. If we want to be church, it's got to be that testimony. It's got to be that pure and that readied to offer up our life. Because that's when you know someone really means it. Words are cheap, but when you give your life behind it, you don't even need to say so many words. And that's how Jesus has desired it to be. So, really, we really need to think about it. And I'm not trying to be dramatic because it wasn't dramatic for Jesus. Jesus said this at his Last Supper. Similar words are said by John in the Epistle of John. A time of persecution. He says, as Christ is... How do we know love? We know life, love by this, that Christ laid down his life. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. In other words, that makes sense. Now you might think, well, how do I lay down my life for my brothers and sisters? You forget about yourself. And you love God so much that you love his people. Because we can fool ourselves. By saying, oh, I really love God, and I've experienced God, and he's so important to me. But Jesus is saying, unless you're in a place in your heart of hearts, which God can give for those who seek, unless you're in a place to offer up your life in their behalf, you may be fooling yourself. One thing is clear, you will not fool anyone watching. They will not know that you or I are a disciple. And we want them to know that. Because the whole point of discipleship is that we're able to give our lives as a living sacrifice. That we're able to give a testimony of love. So what does this mean? It means you serve people when you don't feel like serving them. It means you pray for people and they have no idea that you're praying for them and you don't care that you care about that. It means that you say to the Lord, yes, I am one with you. How can I love you more? And he says something similar as he said to Peter when he said, feed my sheep. There's always a connection with the body. There's never a love for God in isolation apart from brothers and sisters. That is a huge correction to many who would say they have deep, powerful spiritual experiences in intercession, but they're not thinking about their brothers and sisters hardly at all. And this isn't a word meant to condemn. This is a word to clarify for all of us. And the Lord wants us to be clear that the nature of his love is always meant to be given away and just to the degree that he gave it away. So we want to say to the Lord, Lord, we love you. We want to love you more. And it comes to a time when we have to come before him and say, Lord, how can I love you more? What else can I do for you? And he will say, bless my brother, bless my sister with your life. What does that mean for us? Your brothers and sisters, communicate to them the love that I put in your heart. Give them a blessing in my name. Pray on behalf of the body because my heart is for my people and all those who would be my people. Don't pray for the body because you're supposed to. Pray for the body because God has shown you your, his love and you must. Don't pray for the body because you're supposed to and you'll feel guilty if you don't. Have such a relationship with the Lord that you pray for the body because you see his heart. We're asking for his heart. Here it is. You see his heart. And so 
you must, you're compelled and constrained to pray for blessings and grace for the body. And that's one of the things to pray for. The Lord really wants us to ask for grace. I mean, he wants to give us what we can't give ourselves. And he wants, to under, he wants us to understand that we really need grace. We really need something we can't give ourselves. And we need to stop straining at the oars and put up the sail and let the wind blow instead. We have to let the Spirit of God have his way and not try. That's inflated, that's arrogant, and it's impotent. It will not be a testimony that we are his disciples. Laying down our life isn't trying to lay down our life. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit being compelled to love to that degree. That's holy. We talk about the Lord is holy. That's what we're called to be. Holy means we have no ulterior motives in our relationships with our brothers or sisters. We're not trying to get something from them. We're not trying to get a well done from them. We're, trying to, we're not trying to help them be pleased with us. We are loving them because they are lovable by Jesus. Jesus sees them as completely worthy of his life. And that's why John, another place, says, if Jesus laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How can we not? Are we better than him? Do we have another kind of love that's superior? No, absolutely not. The love of Christ in us constrains us to be loyal to one another, to speak the truth in love to one another, to serve in such a way that it costs us, not when we make time or when it's easy. Now again, we have to understand this is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not like something that we have to figure out or can figure out. It's just the nature of our communion with the Lord is such as, Lord, I'm seeking. I want to offer you a better offering. I want to love you more. So our goal is not to love him just enough, right? Our goal is to love him the way he loves us. And that was more than enough. And so in our own situation, when we're saying we want to love him more, we say, Lord, I have a bouquet for you. Help me find another flower. Help me find something else to make it lavish. How can we be lavish in our love for God? Loving one another the way Jesus has loved us. That goes overboard for many, many people. We can go on and on and we can devise in our mind powerful acts of sacrifice and giving of great resources to the Lord. But the Lord is saying, I want you to love my people the way I love them. Because in the scriptures, it makes really clear that love builds up the body, that love makes it look like Jesus. And that is our call. And the Spirit of God is given now to our hearts of flesh, not a stone, hearts that have been animated by the Holy Spirit, now the Word of God, so that although we do love one another, we want to say to the Lord, I want to offer even yet a deeper and more profound love offering. I don't know how to do it. I don't know if I can do it. But I want to do it. Hear that. But I want to do it. That counts a lot. I want to do it. So Lord, help me give you that offering. And so we'll say, I don't know where to get the other flowers. In other words, in this case, I don't know how else to serve you. And he says, can I show you where they are in your life so you can gather that flower too? Or to put it another way, we want to ask for fire. We want the fire of God to be upon us. And that's really a good prayer, that the fire of the Holy Spirit have free reign. But there's another way to look at this. Certainly we can ask for grace, for an increased uh, intensity of fire and burning. But also, what we can do is this. We can add our own wood. We can add something to the fire that burns. What in our life can we add to the fire that will make the fire larger, more pronounced? What is it that we'll offer up that we didn't even think of offering up, but God shows us Here's where the wood is. 
as we, he shows us the flower, here's the wood, add that to the pile and watch your fire grow. So I think of this passage in John when Jesus went and he you know, threw over the tables and when he made a cord into a whip and when he threw over the money and you know, he just was whipping the tables and just cast, telling them to basically stop this. And he was acting, it seemed like, and I don't mean any disrespect for this, he was acting like a madman. He wasn't comported. He said, which table should I begin with? How many, how many coins should I throw over? You know, how hard, should I, how hard should I whack the whip against whatever I'm going to whack the whip against? He, but the disciples saw him and they said, aha, that's what zeal looks like. The zeal of the Lord had consumed him. Do you want to be consumed by the zeal of the Lord? You have to be ready to act like a madman. The love of God is so strong, you don't care about other people. You care about the glory of God. That's what Jesus was caring about. He was caring about giving honor to the Lord so they'd see him rightly. They'd understand that what was going on in the temple was not his father, but that was man's doing. And when Jesus shows up, some people begin to see that. They begin to understand how inappropriate all that was. Before Jesus showed up, they were pretty content with what was going on. And I'm sure numbers of people prayed there and tried to act with some kind of comport of reverence. But when Jesus shows up and says, this is totally inappropriate, because the love of God could not be held back in his heart of hearts. He just couldn't take it anymore. And when that works within us, we will be very wild and generous with one another. We will give in a way that we never thought we could give before. And the truth is, we couldn't. But with the grace of God, we can do anything. With the presence of the Lord. And in the name of love, we are open to receive anything. So the most evangelistic thing is when people come to see us and they see our affection. How about just hugging one another just to hug them? Put your arm around them. Speak kindly to them. Be very courteous. Like please and thank you. Still count. Count a lot. You know, be, be generous with cards and gifts. And, I mean, these are just examples. Again, these aren't the things you're supposed to do. These are the things that just come out when you're saying, I want to bless this person. I don't want to just do what I, you know, to get it done. I want them to know the love of God through me. That's what my spirit wants. Lord, help my spirit. Give me grace. Give me your presence. Give me your power. Give me wisdom about the nature of your love. And change me from the inside. Because I'm not content with the love I've given you. And therefore with the love that I've given my brothers and sisters. May you be glorified as people look at us and say, ah, that's what a disciple of love looks like. They're really following Jesus. They look just like him. That's the call of the church. That's one of the major definitions of what makes church, church. That we look like this kind of disciple of love. You know, by the grace of God, that's happening and will continue to happen as we say yes to the Lord. As I've said before, one of the most powerful prayers is to say yes to him. Yes, in the sense of it's worship. Yes, you fill in the blank, Lord, just yes to you. Many times in my prayer time, with prayer music on or without, I just say yes. And I know he knows what I mean. Whatever it is, he doesn't have to get my permission ahead of time. It's yes first, and then I'll find out. Because I know and I count on for the grace for him to fill out that yes into action and into worship, true worship, and to give him the glory that I so much want to give. You can do that too. And that will happen with you as well. You'll find your yes growing stronger, longer, deeper, and that you'll get revelation. How to say that yes, and he'll fill in the blank, and you'll say, thank you, Lord because you're helping me be more lavish in my love for you. When I see yours, I must 
Give more. I want to. Thank you for answering my prayer. Amen.